our next speaker. And just to give you a little bit of a heads up, I think our plan is to have, after uh, Dr. Yoshihara does his presentation, uh, is, is that we'll aim to take a 10-minute break afterwards at about 10.35 or so uh, as, we, uh, as we proceed from here. Um, our second speaker. Um, I have been following uh, Dr. Yoshihara's writings on Chinese maritime strategy for some time. And when I was in the process of putting together this conference and thinking about who would be key participants in it, uh, his, uh, Dr. Yoshihara uh, headed my list because I felt that he would be able to give us not only the, 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 uh, the most up-to-date and most recent developments in terms of Chinese maritime strategy, but would also be someone who could place it within the context of China's larger strategic and geopolitical ambitions, as well as China's larger historical perspective on precisely these kinds of issues and questions. Dr. Yoshihara, senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. Um, before joining CSBA, he held the John A. Van Buren Chair of Asia Pacific Studies at the US Naval War College, where he taught strategy for over a decade. He was also an affiliate member of the War College's China Maritime Studies Institute. He's been visiting professor at the Fletcher School of Law at Tufts University, at the School of Global Policy and Strategy Department at the US Air War College. He's the co-author of Red Star Over the Pacific, China's Rise and the Challenge of US Maritime Strategy, published in 2010, which I strongly recommend for anyone who wants a good, robust background on all the issues that we're talking about. Translations of Red Star, in fact, over the the Pacific have been published in China, of course, Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and Germany. He holds a PhD from the Fletcher School uh, and an MA from the uh, School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yoshihara. Thank you very much for that kind introduction. <clears throat> it's a real pleasure for me to be here today to speak to you about uh, Chinese maritime strategy, uh, but really talking about Chinese maritime strategy in terms of the larger forces that are driving China to the sea. And many of the factors that we'll be talking about this morning are also forces that are shaping China's grand strategy. And so by discussing those factors, we get a sense of what's driving China's larger national purposes and how does the Chinese maritime strategy support those larger purposes. I think this goes very much in line with the Admiral's earlier comments that when we talk about maritime strategy, it is more than just about big navies and gray hulls plying the seas. It is really thinking about all the implements of national power and how that fits into China's larger national agenda. And so what I would like to talk about today are <clears throat> things that are historical in nature, China's interpretation of its own history, all the way down to the role of individuals and how these forces have shaped China's maritime strategy and how these forces have determined, in some ways, China's sea power buildup. <clears throat> what I'd like to first of all start is to acknowledge that Chinese analysts and scholars have increasingly approached the study of Chinese sea power in a much more comprehensive manner. In fact, the way they write about sea power would make Alfred Thayer Mahan proud. Uh, here we have a, a scholar from uh, Tongji University basically arguing that China's maritime strategy must serve China's larger national purposes, and that the sources of China's maritime strategy are determined by such larger forces as China's unique historical experiences, China's economic needs, and the political will of the Chinese leadership. So again, this is an approach that really thinks about maritime affairs in the broader context of China's grand strategy. We also have another scholar from Peking University who argues that maritime power, or the implements of maritime power, is not just about navies. In fact, it is about essentially how China can employ things like its maritime economics, its maritime diplomacy, as well as an effective use of maritime international law to serve China's larger purposes in the maritime domain. And so following the cue of these Chinese scholars, I'm going to take a broader approach 
in interpreting and in thinking about China's maritime strategy. And my argument is going to be fairly straightforward. It is that China's turn to the seas will be a permanent factor in Asian politics for years, if not decades to come. That this is not a passing phenomenon. This is not a fad. China is not going away anytime soon in the maritime domain, and that the United States and the West had better get used to it. So let me talk about history. As we all know, the Chinese are obsessed about the so-called century of humiliation right? that began in the mid-19th century. And of course, the narrative is that China was weak uh, because of its dynastic weakness, and that made China vulnerable to Western imperial aggression. And here we have President Xi Jinping talking about it, the 19th Party Congress. And what's his argument? The Chinese Communist Party reversed China's decline right, and created the new China. And this narrative very much informs China's maritime strategy. Let me turn to Admiral Wu Li, the former commander of the Chinese Navy, who relinquished his command in early 2017. And he makes a very powerful argument about 10 years ago when he first took command, explaining why China needs to develop sea power. What does he say? Well, he uses history. During the century of humiliation, because of China's weakness, China suffered from Western imperial aggression. And all of that Western imperial aggression came from the seas, and they're counting. In fact, China suffered exactly 470 invasions from the seas, large and small. And so to the admiral, the lesson is clear. Never again. Never again will China be humiliated by outside powers. And the only way to avoid that humiliation is to be strong at sea. In fact, to be very strong at sea. These are people with chips on their shoulder. If you think about it, right, their interpretation of history suggests that the Chinese Navy actually has a responsibility to right this historical wrong. So this historical narrative, this historical interpretation is a powerful emotive force driving China to the seas. Here we have a graphic that I found in multiple Chinese studies on Chinese sea power that basically depicts the various avenues of approach that Western imperial powers took to invade China from the sea. Notice, for example, that there were several important routes through the South China Sea to land on the Chinese southern coast. And the Chinese figures and numbers in, in, at the bottom basically depict the time frame, the different types of Western imperial powers, and the specific locations that these Western imperial powers landed along the Chinese coast. So this is very much a part of the Chinese narrative about why China needs to be strong so that it won't be bullied again by outside powers. The second power, uh, factor is geography. And as many of you know, uh, the Chinese have a unique geostrategic perspective about the maritime domain, this whole idea of the first island chain that runs through the Japanese islands, through Taiwan, down into the Philippines. The one observation I'd like to make about this is that this is a quintessentially Sinocentric worldview. It's only the first island chain. It only makes sense geographically if you're sitting in Beijing looking out into the Western Pacific. And what Chinese decision makers see uh, is essentially a great wall in reverse, a physical impediment to China's maritime ambitions, essentially a series of sentinels standing in the way of China. And that China must seek to not only break through the island chain, but I think most importantly, this is the part that I think needs to that needs to be emphasized, is the imperative to control events over the bodies of water bounded by the first island chain, or as the Admiral called it, the, the gray region. This is the place where China needs to be able to assert control in order to control its destiny at sea. Let me let the Chinese speak for themselves. This is a Chinese map depicting the first island chain that stretches from the Aleutians all the way down to Singapore, the second island chain that runs through the Marianas, centered on Guam, the third island chain running through the Hawaii Islands centered on Pearl Harbor. And depending on who you talk to, there's even the fourth island chain, which is the American West Coast centered on San Diego, right? another hub of American naval power. So as you can see, as the Chinese look out into the Western Pacific, what they actually see when they talk about the island chains are concentric rings of American military power that stretches from the American homeland right into China's backyard enabled by a series of island bases that enables the United States to project its expeditionary forces to harm China's security interests. And when you read Chinese doctrinal writings, 
they frequently refer obliquely to a powerful adversary, a powerful opponent, a powerful enemy. They're referring to the United States because what they fear most, again, enabled by the U.S. basing infrastructure on these island chains, is the ability of the United States to not only impose its will in the maritime domain, but also to harm China's seaboard and seaborne interests. And so geography then very much influences the way uh, China views the United States and its allies in the Western Pacific. Let me now talk about economics. And this is clearly a major driver for China's turn to the seas. Here I want to talk about the intersection of geography and economics. The first island chain forms a series of narrow seas and choke points, through which Chinese mariners, both commercial and military in nature, must pass through in order to reach the open waters of the Pacific Ocean and the Indian Ocean. That's just geographic reality. And what makes it particularly uncomfortable from the Chinese perspective is that the occupants of the first island chain who command the approaches to those narrow seas and choke points are either formal allies of the United States or close friends. And this, again, animates Chinese threat perceptions that a hostile outside power, aka the United States, might form a coalition of powers that would seek to choke off China's access to seaborne commerce. This is, again, a major um, influence on Chinese threat perceptions. And this fear of being closed off from the seas is interacting with a massive transformation of China's social economic structure and Chinese demographics. As a result of the reform and opening uh, of the late 1970s, what we've witnessed is a massive migration of the Chinese population to the coast, all of them looking for jobs, looking uh, to work in the manufacturing sector, for example. And what we've seen is the emergence of three major economic clusters along the coast. The one to the north is the Bohai Economic Rim, centered on Beijing and Tianjin. The one in the, on the middle part of the coast is the uh, Yangtze River Delta Economic Zone, centered on Shanghai, Ningbo, and as far west as Nanjing. And to the south, the Pearl River Delta Economic Zone, centered on Guangzhou and Shenzhen. What this really, truly transformative demographic shifts had led to is massive concentration of not only populations, but economic productivity and wealth and growth in these three clusters. They're not megacities anymore. They're called megalopolises, which I had to learn to, how to pronounce. Uh, megalopolises are basically uh, a, sort of a blob of various megacities in which their boundaries increasingly blur because they're getting so large. Uh, and just to give you a sense of the scale of a megalopolis, the uh, Pearl River Delta Economic Zone, depending on where you carve out the, the boundaries, it could have as many as 46 million people in that pocket alone. That would make it a major country in and of itself in terms of population size. This is remarkable. And what that has led to is, of course, the Chinese sense that they need to protect China's coastal assets because China's most important political, economic, military, cultural centers are now all located on the coast. And this transition in which the Chinese call facing the sea and with their backs to land is that increasingly their economic, political centers of gravity are interacting with their threat perceptions about the potential military threats that could emerge from the first island chain. That the striking power of the United States and its allies might threaten China's equities along its coast. The further reinforcing the need for China to seek to control events uh, over the bodies of water bounded by the first island chain. And let's go back to Admiral Wu Li who states that China, in fact, has a jurisdiction and sovereignty over 3 million square kilometers of water. This is, of course, that gray region that we just discussed. Uh, and of course, if you buy this number, you'd have to accept that China has 80 to 90 percent of the South China Sea. Because if you take out the South China Sea, China does not have 3 million square kilometers of sovereignty or jurisdiction. Now, what's important about this area, of course, is that um, it encompasses a very large part of the South China Sea. And of course, within the South China Sea are critical economic uh, interests that China has, including fisheries, right? Uh, and in, an increasingly important part of the Chinese diet as disposable incomes increase across China. Energy resources beneath the seabed of these bodies of water, 
And of course, it's important to think of the South China Sea as a strategic corridor, as a strategic approach to the Chinese market. All of the goods and services that depart from Europe, Middle East, and Africa must ideally pass through the South China Sea in order to reach Chinese markets. This makes the South China Sea a critical economic corridor. And it's not surprising, therefore, that the Chinese have conducted anti-piracy patrols to secure its sea lines of communications for nearly a decade. It's hard to believe it's been almost a decade. They are on their 27th naval escort mission. They've been conducting these patrols on virtually on an uninterrupted basis, highlighting the value, the economic value that the Chinese attach to the maritime domain. Let me now talk about individuals. And I think this is frequently overlooked, the role of Chinese individuals in shaping Chinese maritime strategy. Now, there's no doubt that uh, President Hu Jintao or President Xi Jinping have made a huge impact on China's turn to the seas over the past decade. But really, the person that I would give most credit to in China's turn to the seas is actually paramount leader Deng Xiaoping. Now, related to this topic of my talk about Chinese grand strategists, I would say Deng Xiaoping was a grand strategist. He came up with this broad idea about China's need to pursue peace and development meaning that China needed a peaceful international security environment in order to develop China's national economy. And in his speeches to his cadre in the, as early as the late 1970s, Deng clearly recognized that if China were to embrace the US-led economic order in order to reform and open up, China would become increasingly dependent on seaborne commerce. And so he picked his right-hand man, Admiral Liu Huaqing, to essentially develop the first coherent naval strategy for China. And what is remarkable about Admiral Liu Huaqing, pictured here on the right, uh, is that many elements of his ideas and concepts that he developed in the 1980s remain with the Chinese Navy to this very day, including this idea of offshore defense, which I'll talk about uh, if, if you'd like during the Q&A. Indeed, uh, he's the one who really defined the geographic scope of the first island chain. And when did he define the first island chain? According to his selected military writings, he articulated the idea of the first island chain in 1987. This is an idea that is over three decades old. And what I would argue is that what we're seeing today, essentially, are the fruits of the intellectual investments that were made by these folks decades and decades ago. Again, I think reinforcing this notion that the Chinese had a long-term vision, had a grand strategy for approaching the maritime domain, and under the, their national circumstances, uh, tried to develop a strategy to meet those longer-term aims. And of course, Admiral Wu Li, whom I've already mentioned, he is perhaps the, the most responsible for China's recent naval modernization. It is uh, in, in large part due to his personal drive, his ability to deal with the institutions and bureaucracies inherent to any military that has enabled China to engage in this remarkable naval modernization that we see today. In fact, many PLA watchers these days liken him to Admiral Rickover in terms of his ability to change the institutions, to change his direction, to reinforce those in institutional corporate culture to engage in this remarkable modernization. Let me now turn to the last segment uh, of my talk, and that's the material implements of Chinese sea power. There's no question that on the naval side, the Chinese Navy has transformed itself from a largely coastal defensive force composed of obsolescent Soviet technologies, as represented by the dinky little ship in the foreground, to an increasingly modern capable fighting force as represented by the much larger beautiful surface combatant in the background. And as a result, what we've seen is the beginnings of the serial production of fairly modern surface combatants plying the oceans now in China's near seas. And of course, the thing that captures the most attention is China's carrier program, of which one was commissioned in 2012 and another one is in the works. But I want to emphasize, this isn't just about navies and this isn't just about big ships, big warships, gray hulls plying the ocean. Another element of Chinese sea power is Chinese air power, shore-based air power. Here we have a Chinese medium-range bomber conducting what PLA watchers consider to be a deterrent patrol in the South China Sea. What's interesting about this photo is not the bomber itself, it's the feature behind it, the feature of Scarborough Shoal. 
This is clearly an attempt by the Chinese to send a deterrent signal about China's resolve to defend its interests against rival claimants, in this case the Philippines, and a signal to the United States. This was a high-resolution photo released by the Chinese military through a microblog. This was not leaked. This wasn't anything secret. This was designed specifically to send a signal to both the region and to the United States. Another element of Chinese sea power is not just air power. It's also Chinese missile power. Here we have a longer-range anti-ship ballistic missile that was paraded by the Chinese. This capability allows China to influence events at sea directly from the mainland. In fact, because of the longer range of this missile, it could potentially allow China to launch these missiles deep in the interior of China to strike moving targets at sea. But it's not just missile power. It's also civilian non-military power. Here we have a Chinese Coast Guard cutter. Uh, this has been nicknamed the Monster uh, because it displaces over 10,000 tons. Uh, it is the largest Coast Guard cutter of its kind in the world. And you might wonder, why, why would the Chinese build this? Well, if the Chinese doctrine is to ram first and ask questions later, for example, then it would make sense for you to build something big for you to outmuscle your rival claimants. But what is also interesting about the non-military dimension of Chinese sea power is the civil military nexus. Here we have a Chinese Coast Guard cutter, which is actually a derivative of a Chinese surface combatant. And here we have a Chinese graphic very helpfully telling us that the, that the origins of the Chinese cutter is, in fact, the Chinese frigate. Or we have a, here another picture of a smaller Chinese Coast Guard cutter. Its predecessor, the origins of this, com, uh, of this uh, surface vessel, was a smaller naval combatant, a Chinese naval corvette. Presumably, these superstructures and hulls would give the China Coast Guard greater staying power in the maritime domain transfer of technology from the military side to the civilian side. What this has led to, I believe, is a major shift in the naval and the larger maritime balance of power. The Pentagon's annual report on Chinese military power has been telling us for quite a few years that the Chinese Navy is already the largest in Asia. And uh, based on my estimates, uh, the Chinese surface fleet alone has experienced a massive growth spurt. And I would be willing to put all kinds of adjectives in front of this modernization. Remarkable, astonishing, amazing. Based on my count, China had about seven surface combatants that would be considered modern by Western standards. Within 10 years, China built a tenfold increase in its surface combatants, most of them in the lighter displacement in corvettes. But nevertheless, this is shifting the naval balance of power, certainly within Asia. And given what's being built in shipyards today, what's already been launched, China could potentially have more than 90 modern surface combatants by the end of this year. Again, this, I think, is a, it's a, it's a significant number to, to observe. And I think combined with the growing professionalism that the Admiral had, identi uh, had identified, what we've seen is a convergence of both Chinese hardware and Chinese software that's going to give China more staying power and potentially more coercive leverage in maritime Asia. As a result, Careful watchers of the Chinese military, including um, Admiral Mike McDivitt, made this observation that by 2020, China will have the largest navy in the world, depending on how you count ships, and will likely have the most capable expeditionary force in the world, second only to the US Navy. Again, if you asked PLA watchers 10, 15 years ago whether someone like Admiral McDivitt would make this conclusion, I think most people would say highly unlikely. We're, you know, what, you know, what are you smoking? But this is the reality now. People are now beginning to make these types of projections about the future of Chinese naval power. In fact, based on a fairly credible projection, it is estimated uh, that uh, China may have over 400 combatants by 2030. Again, I, I would say this is a fairly important shift in the naval balance of power. But again, just emphasize, this isn't just about navies. So if you think about China's maritime law enforcement fleet, China already has the largest maritime law enforcement fleet in Asia. In fact, it is larger than all of Asia's maritime law enforcement fleets combined. And I think this picture perfectly encapsulates the, the scale and the scope of China's maritime law enforcement fleet. And this is a fleet that's going to continue to grow, in addition to the monsters that they've built uh, in recent years.
So given all of this, given the historical imperative, given the economic imperative, the geostrategic imperatives, the role of individuals at the highest levels of the Chinese government and of the Chinese Communist Party, uh, let me draw four preliminary conclusions, four judgments. First of all, I think given the factors that I've identified, it is clear that China attaches very high value to the goals and interests that it's pursuing in the maritime domain, including those in the South China Sea. Um, I would also argue that China's turn to the seas will, in fact, be a permanent factor in Asian politics, not only because of the imperatives, but the staying power of all of the assets that the Chinese have developed in maritime Asia. I think what's interesting about this particular statement is that I advanced a version of this uh, almost 10 years ago. And when I made this argument, it was met with a great deal of skepticism, if not even hostility. The idea that back in the late 2000s or the mid 2000s, that China would be a serious sea power, even a serious regional sea power, seemed implausible and questionable. Now, the study of Chinese sea power is virtually a cottage industry in my field. Uh, and I think just to showcase how far the Chinese have come, it's no longer strange to see on the front pages of the mainstream media about China's naval buildup, about China's development of the islands in the South China Sea. It's almost become conventional wisdom about China's sea power, particularly in maritime Asia. And I think that underscores just how far the Chinese have come. The third point is that as a result of this turn to the seas, maritime Asia is going to become ever more competitive. It's going to be physically more congested and increasingly contested against both American interests in the region, but also the interests of US allies and friends in the region. And again, this is also a statement uh, that would have been unthinkable, say, 10, 15 years ago. Um, one, 10 and 15 years ago, perhaps even before that, it would not have been strange for a US naval vessel to pass through the South China Sea without really running into any opposition, without running into a Chinese uh, counterpart. Today, it is just as likely that a, surface, a US surface combatant entering into the South China Sea would be greeted by a Chinese counterpart and in bridge to bridge communications hear something like, welcome to Chinese waters, and be trailed throughout its passage through the South China Sea. That is the new normal. That is the new strategic reality. And to me, because of this emergence of a new strategic reality, I think it's time for US policymakers and policymakers across Asia to become reacquainted with this idea of risk. That not only is the region going to be riskier operationally and strategically, but that the United States, if it is to fulfill its long-term goals in the region, will have to accept more risk and at certain point in time, impose risk on China as well that the United States must begin to think about risk that matches the value that the United States attaches to its grand strategy in the region, its long-term goals in the region, if the United States is to maintain its position in maritime Asia. So hopefully what I've been able to do this morning is to lay out some markers that frames, I think, China's view about its maritime strategy and form a basis for further discussion today. Thank you very much. Uh, as you know, the term first island chain has a kind of ironic history because the term originally developed as a U.S. strategy with regard to containment of China. This was a concept developed during the Truman years by General Douglas MacArthur, uh, by John Foster Dulles, and thinking about that first island chain as the vital first line of defense, but also in terms of containing China as a revolutionary sinosure for uh, East Asia and even possibly points beyond. But of course, that strategy developed precisely when the United States thought about China as primarily a land power. They were thinking about that massive Chinese army, the successor to the Soviet Red Army, in terms of the use of quantity over quality that they had encountered during the Korean War. Uh, now, this afternoon, we're going to have what promises to be a fascinating lecture by Dr. Payne on the contours and consequences of thinking about one's nation as land power versus maritime power. But is it the case, two, it's a two-part question in a way, is it really the case then that China is now really thinking about itself as a 
maritime power as opposed to a land power. One of the terms that I've heard used is the idea of China will be a hybrid power of land and sea combined. And is it possible that the US concept of uh, defending and commitment to defending that first island chain may need to go through some major modifications because of the way in which China's own strategic objectives, but also the tools by which it's going to achieve those, have now shifted from being land power to being a maritime power? Great question. So uh, let me talk about that historical anecdote. And I think what's interesting is that in terms of China's historical interpretation, the villain behind the first island chain concept is indeed the United States. Yeah. And they've dug up the archives, and they've dug up all of the speeches from Dean Acheson all the way to President Eisenhower, who've made this argument, and, and including um, General MacArthur, talking about using that first island chain as a series of island bases to project American power along the East Asian littoral to contain the Soviet Union and communist China. So they've been looking at this island chain and attributing the threat from the United States throughout the Cold War period. So that's, 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 that's a really important point to make, is that, again, it's very much rooted in China's historical interpretations of the Cold War. The second point uh, about the, uh, China's orientation, I think what's remarkable about at least the Chinese literature about the topic of China's orientation, whether it's continental or maritime, is that uh, they've been very introspective and that they've looked at past what they call hybrid land sea powers that you just mentioned. And they've tried to learn historical lessons about what are the liabilities of being a hybrid land sea power. And they're very, in, in, in my view, they're very self aware that previous hybrid land sea powers have failed disastrously, whether it's Napoleonic France, Imperial Germany, or the Soviet Union. And their goal is to prevent replaying the history of the past. How do you balance your resources and attention in those two directions in the way that will serve China's continental interests as well as China's maritime interests? But what's also interesting is, is that if you read uh, Chinese official documents, particularly the Chinese documents on its, on its military strategy, is that they've now begun to acknowledge that China now can can afford to, it during this period of time, turn its back on the continental domain and focus its attention in the maritime domain. Uh, for, again, this phrase, fronting the seas and back to the land. Uh, but I think it is still very much anchored in this idea that China has to very, very carefully balance its resources between its continental commitments and its maritime um, priorities. The third point about what the United States should do I think it is important for the United States to rethink uh, its approach. Uh, the notion that the United States can concentrate masses of amounts of military power in a particular location, for example, important locations on the Japanese islands, uh, may no longer be the best approach uh, because, of course, that would lend these major bases vulnerable to, say, a Chinese attack or a Chinese first strike, Chinese preemption, which is uh, well covered in Chinese doctrinal writings. And so rethinking U.S. posture along the first island chain and the second island chain is important. And it's important to note that what used to be considered sanctuaries, like our basing posture in Guam, may not be a sanctuary uh, very soon down the road. And so rethinking our posture in the Western Pacific is, an, is a critical component, component of our strategy. The second part is, uh, engaging with our allies, because what changes the picture substantially? Because we typically think about the balance in terms of a Sino-US naval balance. Mm -hmm. But if you add in the Japanese Navy, the South Korean Navy, the Australian Navy, the Taiwanese Navy, the naval balance shifts. And so, and it is one of our asymmetric advantages that we have high quality friends that can maintain that balance of power in the region. So working closely with our allies is another critical component. The third is to take a page from the Chinese themselves, that we should be thinking about anti-access area denial capabilities at the tactical level to hold at risk the things that the Chinese are building. Those ships that I just showcased to you that the Chinese are building are just as vulnerable to missiles as our ships would be to missiles. So rethinking uh, how we use our own asymmetric options against Chinese capabilities is, uh, is, should be another component of our strategy. We've got time for some questions. Or here. 
Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Mitsuo Nakai, uh, Reagan Foundations. Um, can you comment on the offshore defense that you mentioned? Uh, I'll be curious to know how that's going to be. Thank mm -hmm. you. Sure. So um, Japan, uh, particularly in the late stages of the Cold War, um, developed essentially shore-based maritime strike capabilities. And these tactical ground forces were designed primarily to strike at uh, the anticipated uh, Soviet amphibious assault on Hokkaido Island, and that these missile units were designed to basically take out so Soviet amphibious forces as they approached the Japanese home, home islands. These capabilities have been modernized. Uh, some of them are still located as a result of the Cold War legacy to the north, but there's an increasing emphasis on shifting the posture and those capabilities down, say, for example, along the southwestern islands. There's been a gradual buildup of uh, sensors, uh, command and control, intelligence surveillance capabilities along the southwestern islands, uh, a, a sensor network, essentially, in the southwestern islands. If you combine that with these missile shooters uh, in the southwestern islands, I think what you would, could have is essentially a, a Japanese anti-access area denial bubble along a key approach that China considers to be critical. I mean, think about the Ryukyu Islands, it, the, the uh, Southwestern Islands. It, it basically in, covers the entire East, Chi East China Sea. Uh, if Japan, in cooperation with the United States, could make that area essentially a no-go zone, holding at risk those surface assets that I've just highlighted, I think that would give Japan and the United States a great deal of both operational and strategic leverage. And the point here is these capabilities, these offshore systems, uh, are not designed to be war winners. They're simply supposed to essentially um, impose costs on potential Chinese operations. The goal here is to enhance and shore up deterrence to make potential Chinese operational objectives so costly that they would refuse to roll the iron dice in the first place. The goal here is to shore up deterrence. And again, that means that Thinking in terms of the geographical importance of the first island chain, I think, is reinforced through this offshore concept. Questions? We have one here and then to the back. How is our, do you want to take, we've got one up front here, and then we'll go to the one at the back. Right here. Nadia Chao, Washington correspondent for Liberty Times. Uh, two questions for you, Doctor. Uh, first one is you just mentioned U.S. should impose risk on China in the future. Could you elaborate a little bit? And the second question, yeah, we saw uh, Chinese new activities around the Taiwan Strait, like including the Niaoling carriers and other military maneuvers. From the military point of view, uh, do you think it has any implications? Some people just interpret it as a political message, but I would like to know what do you think? Thank you. Sure. Um, I think I'll start with the latter question first, which is that um, China's growing operational activism along the first island chain uh, has multiple purposes. Uh, one is simply to increase the operational proficiency, the tactical proficiency of the seagoing forces. The more they do that, the better they will get. We know that their operations in the Indian Ocean, these expeditionary operations, have fed back into an overall tactical pr proficiency that's fed into their ability to operate more effectively in the near seas. So doing more of these things is always good for any military. That's one. I think the second is a, um, a series of probing activities uh, to basically test the defenses of the occupants of the first island chain. But I think there's also another element to, to this, which is to centrally, and this is part of the gray zone approach, this is, this is a gray zone tactic, is to normalize Chinese activities within the first island chain. And they, they, Chinese spokesmen frequently say, hey, we're operating in international waters. And for countries like Japan, get used to it. Okay? This attitude is to basically make China's presence in the maritime domain a normal fact of life for everyone else. Uh, but there's also a, a, a more kind of pernicious operational strategic and operational and strategic effect, which is that if you normalize these operations, it has a numbing effect in a way on the defenses of our allies. Um, 
And so I think that's, that's one potential danger. The strategic danger is that um, things like uh, China's uh, intrusions into the contiguous zone and territorial waters around the Senkakus has gone from a front page news matter to being on the sixth page of a Japanese newspaper. That's another form of normalizing. Normalizing a new strategic reality in maritime Asia. So I think these, these activities have all of these, I think, added mm -hmm. effects. Um, I'm, I'm not as concerned about the, the carrier itself. Um, this seems to me, it seems to me that that's a symmetrical response from the Chinese. Uh, and that, in some ways, plays to US and allied strengths. Uh, because it's just another big, very capital-intensive asset that the United States and allies can hold at risk. Uh, so um, the carrier itself is not necessarily by itself um, a, any sort of uh, game changer. Uh, as for your earlier point, um, I think the, this offshore option of developing our own anti-access area denial capabilities is a form of risk. But I think as we think about this in terms of a larger peer competition between China and the United States, um, we, sh we should be willing and able to put everything else on the table in terms of uh, putting, putting the relationship overall at greater risk, elements of the relationship at greater risk in response to China's assertiveness in the maritime domain. So it's not just a symmetrical tit-for-tat response for what China is doing in the maritime domain, but to say that we're prepared to essentially hold at risk other elements of our larger relationship because we, the United States, thinks that the norms and the rules underwriting order in, in Asia is just that important. Time for one more question, and then I'm going to pop the last question. Um, I think that would uh, depend on the scenario, but I think for the kinds of kind of high-end kinetic issues, I think that's going to be largely a, a China issue. But I think you raise an important issue, which is that, um, and I think this reinforces the Admiral's earlier point, uh, which is that the United States uh, can no longer focus on one geographic region, that it's going to have to deal with problems happening in Europe as a result of Russian adventurism, as well as China's growing assertiveness in maritime Asia, as well as Iran's growing uh, ambitions in the region. Uh, and so I think the United States, of course, as a global power, cannot afford to focus only on one area. It has to have a posture for all three regions. And, and that has been really the, the formula for success in terms of US global strategy which is to maintain a favorable balance of power in all three parts of the Eurasian Greenland. And that's been the recipe for US strategic success since the end of World War II. And so how do you build up your forces, maintain your force structure in a way that enables you to maintain those favorable balances across these three key regions, I think will remain relevant. And, and so how do you balance your forces? How do you balance, apportion your forces, I think should, should continue to be an important part of our strategic debate. My last question is this, and then we'll break. Um, you've spoken about the PLAN's uh, surface combatants and characterized them, I think, very well, and how they integrate in with its larger maritime strategy. Could you give us a quick characterization from the Chinese perspective on its undersea capabilities, and particularly its submarine force, which, as uh, Admiral Ruffhead mentioned, uh, is, is one of the key components in its military naval strength. Yeah, China's undersea forces is indeed one of the, one of the key pillars of its, of its naval strategy. Uh, and uh, it is the area that has gotten the most attention because it is uh, very much uh, an essential component of its anti-access area denial strategy. Um, and uh, that is, of course, for these two 
to interdict uh, oncoming forces into China's backyard. So uh, I think China is focusing increasingly on uh, developing unmanned undersea systems as well. Uh, that, that part of the competition will become increasingly competitive. Uh, it looks like uh, the Chinese are very interested in instrumenting key parts of the maritime domain to make these regions as transparent as possible because they too understand that the U.S. Navy's, one of the U.S. Navy's trump cards is its very capable submarine force. And so I think that is indeed very much part of the competition. The submarine, anti-submarine competition, I think, is going to be a major component of this peer-to-peer -peer rivalry. And what you're saying is going to be a fact of life in the South China Sea and elsewhere in the Indo-Pacific region for a long time to come. Absolutely. Toshi Yoshihara, thank you very much. Thank you.